Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members and guests. Hey, a special shout out to some folks who, who uh, might be with us tonight. Uh, we invited members of the Frederick Camera Click, so we might have a few of those people on board. We invited the Lancaster, oh, that's with Cam Miller and her group. We invited the Lancaster Meetup group with Lynn Garwood. And we also invited the Hillview uh, group from Coatesville, which includes my brother Chip. He's on board. Hi, Chip. And uh, Ron Saltzman. So welcome, guys. Hope you enjoy the program. We have a very special guest speaker this evening. So before we get to that, let me remind you that I am going to disappear for a while. Uh, many of you already know I'm going, going on the world cruise that has been long awaited. So Joe's taking over for me. Thank you, Joe. And things will be running just as normal, maybe better. And uh, I'll be back in May. In May. Okay. Uh, our next online meeting, which Joe will be running, will be on January the 8th. January the 8th. Joe will put out the uh, email uh, sometime soon, and it will have the link. And, of course, uh, it is a competition, I should say. Competition, no theme. All right. So let me uh, wish everybody a happy holidays, and I'll turn it over to Joe. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Uh, regarding trips coming up, we have uh, quite a few, actually. On the 13th of January, we're going to Heisman's Mill, which is about 30 minutes from Mechanicsburg. It's over in the Carlisle area, and it rivals the uh, signature place we've gone to, which is Anderson Mill, and it's much, much closer, and so we're going to be doing that. And we have a state capital date. Uh, we have a, a private tour of the state capital. That's going to be on January the 19th. That's on a Friday. And we're constrained somewhat by the availability of the various venues that we go to at the state capital. And that is a really, really good event. So that's coming up on the 19th. And then on the 21st, Mike Donovan, are you here, Mike? Uh, I am. You're leading the trip to the uh, Susquehanna Art Museum and to the uh, Midtown Scholar. You want to tell them a little bit about that? Uh, yes, there's a, um, a display by Dean Arbus over at the Susquehanna Art Museum. And that's that's really a monumental achievement to get a collection of her work there. Um, she is known or was known for photographing people on the fringes of society and making them look just as important as anybody else. Um, it is parental guidance suggested. <laughs> she does not hesitate to photograph all kinds of things. So um, if, if you look at her work and you think, well, I could have done that. Well, you didn't do it <laughs> and she did. And I didn't do it, and she did. And she did it in the late 60s when no one had done it. So um, it's a it's a treat to see her stuff. Um, it's eye-opening, and I think it's important to see. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, just looking out ahead into February. What was the date on that? Oh, that one is on January the 21st. It's on Sunday afternoon. And um, yes, thanks. And then we have uh, Eastern Penitentiary uh, trip down there. That's going to be a major trip. We're going to have probably a Wednesday night session uh, on some tips and tricks. And then it's going to be on uh, the date hasn't actually been firm finalized yet, but we have that in the works and it's going to happen. And we're going to go to the Strasburg Railroad. Uh, that's coming up also. So those are just some um, highlights of what we have coming up. Dennis, back to you. Hey. All right. Thank you, Joe. Okay. At this time, I'll turn the program over to Merle, who's going to introduce our guest speaker. Good evening. Tonight's uh, speaker is Jennifer King. Jennifer is an internationally acclaimed landscape and fine art photographer. I personally have shot with Jennifer many times, and she has a passion for teaching and inspiring other photographers that is unmatched. Um, she is a Moab master photographer, a Singray ambassador, fifth, one of 15 women to follow on 500PX. Jennifer is the founder of Photography 
for the fight against breast cancer. Jennifer is one of the premier black and white photographers in the world with a title win for the U.S. in 2020. Our subject tonight for tonight's presentation is black and white photography. Without further ado, my friend Jennifer King. Thank you. Thanks, Merle, for that nice introduction and everyone for coming out tonight. Joe and Dennis, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, well, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen, so give me just a moment. And while you're doing that, Jennifer, uh, we're going to hold questions uh, until the end of the presentation, if you would, please. Unless something comes up uh, really uh, demanding in the chat, then we'll do that. That's great. I think I lost a screen. Give me one moment. I lost my Zoom screen, so I just need to find it so I can share. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Merle, I'm proving myself right with <laughs> my technical. Yeah, you issue. said it early on. You're not technical. You're <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me get back to share. Okay. All right. Perfect. Hopefully it's sharing now. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks for coming out tonight. And I want to talk about the art of black and white photography. I've always felt that there is something that's quite magical about black and white photography. There is a silver component that creates a sense of illusion. Dark and moody tones can produce an emotional response. And light brings each image to life. And from the many genres of art throughout history, there is one form of art that remains as powerful today as when it first started, and that is the art of photography. Since the creation of the photographic process, the art of photography has been rendered through time by many photographers in very different ways, always translating the changes in our world, capturing our lives and truly enriching our vision. So what makes black and white photography so appealing to so many photographers? Is it the drama of the dark tones, the mystery that it creates, or the feeling that it is more than just a photo, it's a piece of art? I consider black and white photography to be fine art photography and not because color loses anything in translation, but because working in black and white allows us to simply deviate from the norm to create something both behind the lens and in processing that is different than what we see with our eyes. It's a way of approaching your subject completely differently than you normally would and trying to capture your scene by the art of the light. In my case, it's a way of viewing my subject, which is nature, with the intent to create something different than how it appears to most people. One of the more, most important things to realize about black and white photography is that it can translate to a form of fine art. And it is different from color landscape photography, which focuses on realism in what you see through your lens. Black and white photography is a departure from reality. It's an illusion because most of us see in color. So how do we learn to transition from our nature and landscape photography to a fine art approach? We learn to visualize. Learning to become a fine art photographer is easier than it sounds. Pablo Picasso once said, every child is an artist. The problem is to remain an artist once they grow up. Humans are creative by nature, and I'm reminded of this every time I play with my nieces and nephews. 
I watched them play in a world where they are completely separated from reality and stresses. They have this ability to create things in their mind, just as an artist would. So how do we revert to that childlike mentality and find our inner artist after we are distracted adults? Well, we do what children do. They use their senses instead of their minds. Sight, sound, touch, these are physical senses that can really help us to connect to our subject. But there's always more than just physical senses. We have cognitive senses like emotions and feelings. And I know it's always awkward to talk about feelings. You know, everybody just kind of hides when I say that, but it truly is our feelings, more so our emotions and our reactions that help us connect to pretty much everything in life. So why not use them to connect to what we're photographing? Let's break down our senses even more. We have happiness, we have fear, anxiety, peacefulness. Now take one of those senses and mix it with one of your standard, standard senses like sound, for instance. You know, when I go out to photograph the sand dunes in Death Valley, I listen to music. So if you ever hear music in the morning at dawn, particularly Pink Floyd, it's probably me. So come over and say hello. Um, but whatever my reason is for listening to that music or why I react to that music in a certain way, it does put me in a creative state of mind. It puts me in a mood where I contemplate many different things in my life. You know, in this sound inspired reaction, for me, tends to be reflection about people that have come and gone in my life, all the places I've been and lived over the years, and more than anything, the memories that come with the reflection of time. You know, we all go through periods in our lives when our emotions are more prominent in our daily lives for a multitude of reasons. I remember when COVID first broke out in March, 2020, I flew from Norway to Death Valley, to Las Vegas. And there was some hype about something going on, but I didn't really know what was going on until I'd been there for a couple of days. And then the whole world and the park started to shut down. What I love is that I had Death Valley pretty much to myself. And while I was photographing, I was able to tap into my fear and I put that emotion to work. What I learned in that very short amount of time is that there is a difference between converting an image to black and white and creating a black and white image. And that is when my approach to photography completely changed. From that time forward, my focus turned to placing myself in the moment, incorporating my senses and my emotions and my vision into the landscape I was photographing. So how can we do this? Well, a great way to tap into emotions is to practice some basic visualization techniques. You know, for example, say you plan to photograph the Oregon coast. Before you leave home, spend 15 to 20 minutes searching for photos of the area that you plan to photograph to help you achieve some visual stimulation. What photos did you react to? Were they long exposures of water? Maybe you were drawn to reflections in the sand. You know, make a note of what triggered your response and make that your target subject. Work on your approach. I know normally we don't think of black and white photography as having a high dynamic range, but it does. There are 256 shades of gray in your image. And you will need to choose which of these shades or tones you want to emphasize. Contrast is a great tool for black and white photography. So in fact, I prefer to photograph in high contrast light because I like darker tones and brighter whites. What does this mean? Well, as someone who's been a landscape photographer for a while, it means I can photograph in the middle of the day and most of my black and whites are. Creating fine art through photography is not so much about what you photograph 
and a lot more about how you photograph. And visualization does play an important role. Try to practice techniques that help you to approach photography in a new um, or even a different way, like meditation or taking a couple of deep breaths so you can relax. Fine tuning your creative side is not a race to the finish line and you are not racing against the sun. When you arrive at your destination, I recommend that you try just closing your eyes for a moment. Try and picture that image that you saw earlier that you reacted to. And now that you have a mental image of what you want to achieve, it's time to put yourself into the image. Think of someone important to you or a special memory. And if you're thinking about work, stop. Take a couple more deep breaths and try again. If you're questioning your settings, Stop. This you can figure out in a few minutes. It's time to get into the creative mode and not so much the technical side. These moments of relaxing or letting go can make you feel like you're out of control, but you are not. You are simply exploring how to express yourself through your art, in our case, photography. And that is the first step on your way to achieving new ways to grow as an artist. When I approach my subject, my intention is to create an image that invokes an emotional response. I want you, the viewer, to feel as though you've stepped into the scene and that you can experience the drama and power of nature in that moment. My black and white images are designed so the viewer reacts to light, to shadow, and to shapes. So to do this, I approach my black and white photography differently than I do my landscape photography. I go with the intention to photograph black and white. So in other words, my landscape sessions and my black and white sessions are separate field sessions. This puts me in a mindset to view the landscape, not by color or clouds or foreground, but instead I look for highlights. Once I find the highlights, I can choose the lens and position the camera to capture that dramatic light I'm seeing. The best advice for any photographer who is exploring black and white photography and their inner artist is to just slow down. Take your time to visually explore the light. I begin my sessions looking with my eyes first instead of through the lens. What is the light touching? Does it make an interesting shape or enhance a part of the subject itself? Then I consider which lens may work best to accomplish what it is I'm seeing with my eyes. Once you begin to photograph by the light and not the landscape, you begin to see landscape differently. Look for light and shadow and you will find drama. Remember that fine art is not based in realism and neither is black and white photography. So it's important to allow yourself to get creative with what you're doing. Change the look and the appearance from what you see with your eyes to what you envision. Reflect back on those images you found while you were researching that you reacted to. Think about them for a moment. See if you can creatively translate that into what's in front of you right now. Then put yourself, your mood into the moment of photographing. Do you feel happy? Do you feel sad? Do you feel intense? Tune in with all that's going on around you. Can you feel the sun on your face? Can you hear the wind? For centuries, centuries, artists have used emotions and their senses as part of their creative process. Allowing yourself to connect, to open up, to react will truly help you find that inner artist that is inside of you, whether you believe it is there or not. You just have to try. The same basic design principles used for landscape photography do apply in black and white. 
And it's important to study and apply the art of composition, as this is always going to be the foundation of any photography that you conduct. For creating black and white images, there are some key design elements that will really help to bring your image to life, like the use of foreground details, which can be so crucial for communicating dimension in black and white, that's extremely important. Having that strong foreground, a middle ground and a background, that creates depth and it increases the vastness in any landscape that we have. And foreground adds a lot of drama to your image. The best way to enhance your foreground is to get low or close to the foreground subject because this allows you to play with spatial relationships by exaggerating the entrance to your photo. This is really fantastic for landscape photography of all kinds, but in black and white, when you only have tonalities, making your foreground dramatic can be really beneficial for that added effect. Another wonderful thing that a strong foreground will do besides create dimension is it can create a sense of placement. Anytime that you provide something in the foreground for the viewer to feel a sense of connection to, they're going to accept it. So if you give the viewer a place to step into your photo that's in your landscape or something for them to reach out and touch, they can feel like they're a part of your image and they feel emotionally connected. And that's a very important part of why we share photography. The use of lines in your images for black and white photography are probably the most effective way to capture the viewer's attention. Now, there are studies shown that your eyes are always going to follow a line. So in any type of photography, knowing how to successfully and creatively compose with line is extremely important. Lines can be one of the strongest structural elements in visual arts. It simply draws the viewer in. It holds attention. And even on their own, lines can create striking images. Eyes are designed to move. And we may, you may remember this when you were young playing with siblings and friends, you know, the staring contest that we all did. How hard is it to stare and not move your eyes? That's a very important thing to understand in visual arts. They have to move. Our eyes need to move. And leading lines are a very effective way to point the viewer to a subject, but they can also on their own create abstract and mysterious photos. From a creative standpoint, images that have really dominant lines can be seen as dramatic, striking, powerful. If it's a curved line, a lot of times the reaction is sensual and calming. Lines that incorporate patterns and textures mixed with a lot of highlight and shadow can be very graphic in nature and they translate very well into black and white photography. I always look for this, these type of elements when I'm in the field because I know they're going to add an element of drama to my black and white. Now, there is little that shows the beauty of nature as well as simplicity. The impact of a simple subject cannot be outweighed artistically or by any grandeur or convey a more powerful story than just plain simplicity. Beauty is in the light and the shapes. And whether it's a landscape or a detail of nature, the art of simplicity can be extremely powerful in black and white. Some of my favorite photos have been taken with a 70 to 200 millimeter or my one to 400 millimeter. Using a longer lens for a landscape or any subject really allows me to isolate the dramatic lighting that I'm seeing. And therefore I'm able to compose and draw your eye directly into the light. Remember, not everything needs to be a grand landscape. Sometimes the light, the line, the simplicity of your scene will communicate more intensity than a complex image can. 
We normally don't think of black and white photography as having a high dynamic range, but it does. Those 256 shades of gray I mentioned, they will become your tones. And choosing tonality is a crucial part of creating your style. Ansel Adams used a zone system for his photography. And while I don't use the scale myself, I did refer to it and study it and taught myself with it because it's a great teaching tool. He used 11 shades of gray in his work, making sure that each tone was represented. After time, personally, I developed a style that I like that has a lot higher contrast, but that's my personal preference. And I think we all elevate to that level at some point in time. I mentioned how contrast is one of the greatest tools in photography, especially black and white. I do prefer that high contrast because I like darker tones and brighter whites. It's moody. I, I guess I feel moody when I'm doing them this way. You know, images that are dark or low key in style, they create an emotional response because dark tones often reflect mood and intensity and often a bit of mystery. Where in contrast to that look, something that has a lot of white, a high key style, Bright images with a lot of white are often felt as peaceful and serene, and it's very easy to approach black and white in this sense as minimalism. Bright tones for black and white images, probably the most popular type of photograph to produce where you are representing a broad range with high tones of darks and lights, this often creates a sense of relax relaxation and many artists are attracted to that style because they're acting or reacting emotionally. Always photograph in raw format. This will allow you to capture as many colors as possible with the highest amount of color range and depth. Why is this important for black and white photography? Well, even though you are processing in black and white, each color becomes a tone. So tonality will range from black to white to all those points of gray in between. This becomes especially important in processing. Watch your histogram. This is extremely important while taking the photo and during the processing stage. You don't wanna blow out your highlights or lose any detail in the blacks. Your histogram is always the best tool for successful photography. And if you're struggling with black and white in the field as you get started, your camera may have a setting to preview the image in monochrome. So if you're in raw format, your photo is still taken in color, but the LCD viewfinder on the back shows you the image in black and white or monochrome. This can really help and assist an artist and a photographer when they're learning to transition to the fine art of black and white photography. And I cannot recommend enough the need to use filters in the field a polarizer, a graduated neutral density filter, or a neutral density filter. These can be every bit as effective in black and white photography. Actually, I think more so than in color because every bit of information that you put into your raw file, the smoother the transition will be in processing. There is an art to processing. Black and white photography is a two-step process. Capturing the image by using visualization and creativity behind the camera. And next is using the computer to bring the image to life. There are many programs and techniques for processing black and white images. Personally, I like to use Adobe Lightroom as it's very user-friendly and they have all the tools needed to get the job done. Now Lightroom does offer some presets that you can use for processing your images. 
such as black and white process, uh, presets. But I've always found that as an artist, self-processing puts more of my ideas and creativity into the final image. Finding your style doesn't end behind the camera. Processing is a very important step in the development and growth as a black and white artist. It will help you to define your style of art. This is something that will develop over time, but you can get started by trying to determine what processing style that you like. To do this, I recommend that you study the presets from Nick software called Silver Effects Pro. Now, I do recommend self-processing. I wanna stress this, but what's so valuable about Silver Effects Pro, if you have it, is that you can use this plugin with Lightroom and you select your photo and you can view that photo with many different processing styles. And that's the benefit is you can scroll through different things, high contrast, low contrast. They must have 20 or 25 things in there that you can see your photo with a preset processing on it. If you continue to go through that same step of looking at one image at a time with Silver Effects Pro, you will likely find that you return to the same preset in their menu, or at least a handful, two or three, sometimes four. Once you realize that, you're now learning what processing styles you like for your own work. And that's when you return to Lightroom or your software program, and you learn how to use those elements to put them in. I do highly encourage photographers not to rely on the presets only, but enhance and learn to improve what you've seen through your own edits and your processing. For my black and white photography, I've learned to compose by the light and not so much the landscape. Let's make a note of things to look for in the field to help with visualization. What is the light touching? Where are the whites? Understand that shadows complement highlights. So these contrasty sections of the landscape may produce your most interesting photos. A black color looks black when it's next to white, but not so much when it's next to 80% gray. Find the shot with your eyes first and then set up the camera. And remember to breathe. This is not a race to the sun. We all get very excited about photography. And a lot of times we already have something in mind. We run out, we set our cameras, tripods down and we start shooting. But approaching black and white differently than you would approach landscape can really help you to create stronger fine art images. And this training that you're giving yourself will actually carry throughout all of your work. Own your own look. This is very important. You have to know when you're going out to try a creative approach that there is no right or no wrong when it comes to art. It's your creation and you can choose your own look. Getting in touch with your inner artist, it takes time. It takes practice. The artist within. It takes separating yourself from everything you know as your normal photography and allowing yourself to go a different way. The more genres and styles of photography that you practice, the more you're going to learn about yourself and your artistic style. This will apply to all of your photography going forward. Black and white photography, it's full of drama, mystery and inspiration, and the best images will always come from within. Photography is a journey Please enjoy the adventure. Thank you.
Now I'm going to take a moment and stop the share on this because I think it's important that you see how I process my images. It's easy to look at someone's photos, but I'd like you to see my thought process. So let me get my Lightroom opened and I'll share the screen again once I do. Okay. I believe you see it now. Okay. <laughs> Got to get it centered on my screen, but there we go. All right. Merle was with me on this particular trip. I mentioned that I had learned a while back to separate my color photography from my black and white photography. And it really does make a tremendous difference. We went to Iceland um, back in... 2021, 22, actually I don't remember what year. And it was a black and white trip. Everything we did that we scouted, that we photographed, that we thought about, everything was with the intention to photograph black and white photography. Now, I've been to Iceland a lot over the years, one of my favorite spots. And before I went, I started thinking how I wanted some of these iconic locations to look like. So I, I thought about them. I envisioned them. I had ideas in my head before I went or in my mind. So when I got to Skogafoss Waterfall, which is this massive, amazing, <laughs> roaring waterfall in Southern Iceland, I already knew what I wanted to accomplish visually. The trick is, of course, getting you know all the photographers out of your way, but it wasn't too busy that morning. But I will say, if I ever get to a location it's super, super busy. You can always just say, which I do, I need to take a professional photo. Can I have two minutes and I'll take a photo of everyone around me? <laughs> you know. So sometimes that works. Um, this time was pretty early morning, so we didn't really need it, but that is a good trick to know. So I had envisioned Skogafoss this way. So when I sat down my camera and I was composing, I knew what I was going for. And all I needed to do was use different settings, maybe compose slightly different in between them, but I wanted a really dark moody look. Let me show you the raw file. Nothing like it, <laughs> which often happens, right? But I knew where I wanted to go. So I'm gonna walk through my thought process and how I process my black and white photography. I want to mention a lot of photographers have different ways of doing it. I like simplicity and I'm not a technical person. So I keep things very simple and I go with an artistic approach. The very first thing I always do while I'm processing is I work on the composition, no matter what the photo is, black and white color, anything. I think that's really important to get it framed correctly before you start. Okay, there we go. Now, the next step, for me, is to turn it into black and white. And the reason I do that, I really want to approach this almost, I refer to it as a finger painting. I want to look at the global adjustment, but I also know that I'm going to have a lot of localized adjustments, a lot of um, dodging, a lot of burning, things like that that are going to bring out certain areas that help me just make this a creation instead of just a photo. One of the first things I'll do is I'll skip past the basic menu here and I come down to my tone curve. And the reason I do that is in the basic menu, you have highlights and shadows, but in the tone curve, you have highlights and lights, darks and shadows. So basically this is a more refined section in Lightroom where you can select lights and highlights and have a smaller selection of tonality to make adjustments to. It's just more refined. I can get a better result by doing this menu versus basic. So I'm going to take my lights while I'm watching my histogram, extremely important, up to where I want to be. I know that my histogram has got a lot of dark and it's got a lot of white. I know the white's in the sky and the waterfall and the dark is everywhere else. But I also know I'm going to work on that some. So I'm just going to do a little global right here just to get it in a better balanced place so I know where to go with everything. Now, 
with landscape photography, I find it a little easier to do mostly global and then go to localize. But when we're working with tonality and black and white, anytime I have a very dark area or even a bright sky like this, my vision doesn't calculate it as part of the scene. So I think it's important to try and make that change. We could select sky here, but I've learned in many cases, certainly from processing this image, that one of the best tools here is going to be the radial gradient. And it is actually the tool I use the most. And the reason is it's the most forgiving. A lot of times when we select sky in our Lightroom, it's not selecting it exactly. And that's going to be very noticeable in black and white photography, especially if a white line or something that's not communicating very well. All right, so I'm going to hide that. I'm going to bring my exposure down slightly, and I'm going to come down here. I want to actually do clarity and dehaze a little bit, too, to see where that brings everything. And then I'll start bringing my exposure down, because I really just want to see what's there. Where's my information? Where are my clouds? How far do I need to stretch it? Obviously, if I take it too far, I'm going to see a lot of black on the top of the water. So I'm going to stretch it out and make it a little thinner and try and get it off the rocks, the darkness. Okay. Now, what's so nice about Lightroom is that I can come back and I can layer those radial filters as I dodge and burn throughout this entire image again and again and again. And that's why I like that particular tool. But it did take my eye away from the brightness. So now I can look at things at a better tonal range. And I want you to notice something here. I'm going to turn this mask off. Look at my histogram when that mask was not on because it was catching the sky. And look at it now that I have brought the sky down a little bit. This is going to allow me to truly look at tonality. What is the hero of the photograph? Where do I want the viewer's attention to go? How do I want it to get there? And this is where I start going piece by piece throughout the image and trying to bring up highlights or bring down darkness or shadows or whatever it is that I want to accomplish. In this case, I have no white, so I knew, know that the waterfall needs to come back up. I'll start with highlights. I always go gently with highlights and then sometimes whites before I go with exposure. I actually have quite a lot of room here, but before I do that, I'm going to get down to one of my sharpening tools. And in effects, my sharpening tools are always going to be Dehaze, which is the strongest, clarity, which is mid-range, at sharpening your mid-range tonalities, and texture is in the uh is the smallest range of pixels for sharpening. So I know that with clarity, I can really bring up the brightness and the white in that waterfall without making a strong impact anywhere else. And that's my goal at the moment. All right. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look for other highlights. I can see here, there are some highlights here. There's a little bit of white over here. So how do I get to those? Well, I can use a brush. Um, I can use the filter. Let's actually do this. I'm going to take a brush. Sorry, I know that bounced a little. I'm just going to come up here slightly, maybe brush it in a little more. And I'm just going to bring up the highlights because there's some white on the edge of that particular area, those rocks. Can you see that coming to life a little bit? And now I can come down here with texture and help that to pop even more. I can come back with another brush and I can try and get this area here. One thing about brushes that I wanna say is very important is you want to treat them like finger paints. You start trying to get things exact and it becomes very noticeable. I usually have a feathering of anywhere 50 to 75, sometimes higher. The feathering is the area see if I can, between the two circles there. So the more feathering, the less noticeable any kind of line is going to be. So I'm going to bring highlights up right here. And I'm going to come back to my texture tool and see if I can accomplish what I want. Sometimes I need a little more clarity, but you have to be careful. Sometimes one tool will work and other times it won't. And then you can play back and forth with these things, right? One of my favorite tools to use, as silly as it seems, is always going to be a vignette, especially if I'm going with dark and moody. I know I'm going to use this. I want to get that drama. I want the tunnel vision in this particular piece of art that I've imagined. 
And I, to do that, that uh, vignette, that post crop vignette can actually bring it in tremendously, bring your vision in. Now I'm also going to look for my mouse wherever it went. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. I'm going to come down here with another radial filter and try and bring some of this stuff in the foreground again, because I think that's really prominent. I'm going to bring highlights up. I'm going to bring up some clarity overall. And basically what I do is I continue to work each image piece by piece by piece until I get to this spot. And I'm going to go to my final one so I can show you where I finished and how many masks I had on here. <laughs> Look at all those. So basically, you can see I have one, let's see. I have one for the sky. I have one for the rock over here. I have several of them here to try and bring out that line of light that I'm seeing here. And you can see where I brought out the white in the water. I continued to bring up more white so that the mist showed up in this section, but not on the outer edges. So there are times where I may have 10 areas of dodging and burning. And there are other times when I have 50. I think the message here is that it doesn't really matter as long as you're happy with the photograph. I will say that I have found it to be extremely important in this type of processing not to rush to it. So in other words, I may process a landscape photo and post it while I'm traveling. But with my black and white, I do not. It typically takes me at least two weeks of working on it, going back, looking at it, working on it, and making sure that my vision is in there. I'm not quick to process these photos because I treat them differently than I do other images. I do want this to be a piece of fine art and an extension of what I envisioned all the way through the process. This was another morning in Iceland. We were down in Vik and we were at the beautiful place out there along uh, Reynas Drangar to get the sea stacks. And I believe I had to crop the image or yeah, I straighten it because I can't take a straight photo for anything. But again, one of the first steps I will always do is black and white. And I know that that morning was not what we anticipated. We had a little bit of fog behind the sea stacks, but we wanted some structure. And while we didn't get it, we were able to say, what can I do to make this work? And we were doing it while we were at the beach. Well, we can use the water. We can use long exposures and time different exposures so that we can get something going on in the foreground for drama. And to do that, basically, one of the first things that we're going to do is some masking. Well, actually, no, I'm going to go down to my tone curve. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to bring up the lights and some of the darks in this one while keeping the shadows down. I still have some really good darks that I'm not need, going to need to bring in, but I want to get some of that white working for me. Now, simply what I'm going to do is to create a linear gradient, bring it up from the bottom, and I'm going to bring up whites. And I'm going to bring up clarity until I really get that working. Now I have a starting point. Now I can envision it and I can go back to my final and say, okay, this is where I ended up, but I need to create some more darkness into sky and maybe brighten up the darks a little bit overall. And this is how I work. Simple, step-by-step -step thought process with a very simple program that works wonderfully. I didn't point it out here yet, but there are tools in here that are quite nice for processing. Let me go back here. There are black and white filters that you could use just as if you were using them back in the film days. And you could select any color here on the slider and see where the colors come in. Um, let's select blue, which is probably more prominent, right? It could bring a lot of blue out in the white right there, which is amazing. Um, and these are essential tools for processing in black and white. You can also select the little icon here, drag it anywhere in the photo and bring out the luminosity that way. The one thing I want to caution against this tool specifically, other tools like dehaze, having dark tones and bringing out a lot of processing can introduce a lot of noise. 
So it's essential that before you publish, you check the noise of the photo. You could do that simply by zooming in. And a lot of times I have to use software that allows for me to process or correct for that noise. Um, there is a new, I don't know how new it is, the denoise in Lightroom and it's personal preference, but I have found that, um, let me see, it's not, it's Topaz denoise. Topaz denoise is the one that I'm working with. That allows me to get a better correction for the noise that I've introduced that's going to be in black and white photography, whether I'm processing film <laughs> or processing on a computer. All right, let's see what kind of questions you have this evening. Okay, looking at the uh, the chat box, we have... So when you go out into the field, Jennifer, you do not shoot both black and white and color in a given uh, segment. You you concentrate on black and white, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. um, at a workshop we were at, at the asylum, I, I did it a little bit differently, but my time was limited and changing. But no, literally I will go out in the field with either the intent to photograph black and white or the intent to photograph color. And that's made a huge impact in what I do. I know it's easy to think, oh, well, I can do that black and white, I can do it later. And I used to do that. But I think when I realized by separating the two forms of art that I was able to get a better result with the mindset that this is going to be a black and white session and going out envisioning it and then processing it that way. Uh, you mentioned about in long exposures using uh, timed exposures. And can you talk about that a little bit uh, on the long? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So long exposure photography is great for any style, but I think everything that has a dramatic, mysterious element to it, like water moving or slowing or streaking for that matter, just getting a different effect really adds to a dramatic effect. Um, so I use neutral density filters and I have a few that I use primarily I have a five stop and a 10 stop with me at all times. And this allows me to put those on my lens and time how long the exposure is going to be. So when the water's coming in and out on the Iceland coast, there were times when I said, let's try one second, let's try 1.6 seconds, let's try three seconds, let's try, you know, half a second each wave is going to come in with a different intensity and amount of water and each time is going to give you a different result. So when I'm photographing long exposures with water specifically, I like to try a variation. I try many different things, usually start with five stop. And then if that's not enough, if I need something longer to make it totally reflective of something, then I may use the 10 stop filter. But that's a valuable tool um, for any type of photography. And I always recommend that people get filters, especially good filters. There are some average ones on the market. Um, I certainly went through my share of average ones, but you need something that's good, test it out from somebody, make sure that it works. Um, because some of them have color cast and some of them like there is a, I want to say what a variable neutral density filter that's very popular on the market by a couple different companies that go from two to eight stops. And while variable sounds fantastic, and I have had a really good one and a really bad one, a lot of times you see like a halo white around the edges or a dark circle in the center. So you really have to be careful with filters. Graduated right. filters, mm -hmm. like graduated. I have those on for um, mornings and evenings, sunrise, sunset, where I want to balance or darken the sky a little bit more to go with the foreground. That is crucial. Can I do it in processing? Of course I can, but I have tested in the field. I have been with professional photographers that say they don't use them and they do when they're photographing on their own. I use them and I've tested scenes with them and without them. And when I use them, the processing has a much more natural look because it's in your raw file, all that data. So very important for filters. We shouldn't forget that in this digital age. Jennifer, yes. Joan asked, uh, you do not seem to use the contrast slider. Well, I don't a whole lot, but keep in mind, one, I would if I wanted, so there's nothing wrong with it, but I've skipped over the contrast. Oh, I know you can't see what I'm doing. I've skipped over the contrast and have gone to 
the tone curve, which is also introducing contrast in smaller stages. So you have the highlight and the lights, and you have the dark and the shadows. When I'm moving those, I am introducing contrast. It's just refined smaller amounts with each slider. So I get a more natural look. A question came up, which is your favorite overhaul lens that you carry? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, I carry so many. I do like a 16 to 35 um, millimeter lens. I do like that. I've used it for a very long time. Um, but then I also like my one to 400. And I do think my favorite changes from time to time. And I think it's important sometimes to take a new lens out of your bag or your closet and say, I haven't used this in a while. I'm going to stick with this for a bit because that forces us to look at everything we do a little bit differently and make things work within those parameters. Excuse me, may I ask uh, just for a clarification? Yes, go ahead. Uh, 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 when you say you separate color from black and white, does that mean that you have your camera set on monocolor uh, all the time, or do you visualize the black and white from the color that you see on your LCD screen or through the uh, eyepiece? I do turn my camera to monochrome when I'm going out to photograph for black and white. I do. And it does help me. Um, after time, I am, after practicing it for a while, I am able to see color and visualize in black and white. But I think the benefit of having my camera set to that eliminates any possibility of distraction. I can keep hyper-focused on that piece of black and white art that I'm attempting to create. Thank you. Jennifer, I'm going to ask Dick Mesner to ask his question. Dick, are you here? Yes, I am. Uh, in printing, if you print bright white, usually the paper shines through. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious as to what papers you use and do you ever allow this paper to shine through or is it your goal to put a certain amount of ink throughout the photo? Excellent questions. Um, I do print my own work and I'll start with the paper that I use. I use Moab papers and if it's a very high contrast black and white, like the one behind me, I will use Entrada Bright. And that paper is a very bright white as opposed to a natural white. That allows me to get those really moody scenes to print in that high contrast that I like. Now, if I'm going with something a little more subtle, like a sand dune or, or one of my photos from Death Valley, I often use Somerset Rag because it is a more natural white and it has a warmer tone to it. So it really depends on the intensity and the design of the photo. High contrast and trot a bright, more, um, I don't know, peaceful, serene, blowing sand dunes, things like that. I do use a Somerset rag. Gardens, things like that, I would use a Somerset rag. So it depends on the content. Now, I, I'm i okay with having a tad bit of black and white pixels in an image, but it does have to be a small amount. And we have to determine that by looking at our image and hitting the triangle in the top corner of our Lightroom to see where that is. Um, a few pixels here and there doesn't matter. It really doesn't show on the paper. A large selected area, yeah, the paper may not look so good. So um, I do try and avoid that, which can be hard in black and white. I've certainly had my lessons from when I first started, is to pay attention to that histogram. And if you have a very small selection of pixels that are black in the shadows of something and it's a small amount, you're okay. That little bit's not going to show. Um, if you have a sky that's really blown out white with just a little bit of cloud, that probably won't look as good on a on a print as it does on the screen. Of course, screens are a lot more forgiving. I hope that answered your questions. One more question go with it. Do you prefer a luster paper, a gloss paper, a matte paper? Yeah, most of my papers are matte and rag. Um, that's just my style. There are a lot of wonderful papers out there. And I know people who make black and white prints on like a pro gloss. I just, that's just not my style. So I tend to go with, um, more natural, natural papers. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. If anybody else would like to ask the question, unmute yourself and then ask Jennifer. Jennifer. 
Any other questions? I'll shoot one in. How about Jennifer, do you ever shoot an infrared? I do get that question a lot. I had an infrared camera converted once and I was playing around with it here and there. I have a Singray, I wanna say it's an eight, 890 filter. They sent me a filter to play around with. And before I knew it, my husband nabbed the camera and he photographs with it. Okay. <laughs> so he's a photographer as well. Um, I, I'm very slow to learn, not in the sense that <laughs> I don't think I'm too slow, but I like to take my time and learn and really put myself into things. And I'm so into the black and white at this point that it seems a logical step to infrared, but it's not that logical for me. I'm so I set the camera aside and then, and Randy, of course, is using it like crazy. So I'm going to have to get another one soon. <laughs> I know why Joe asked that question. It's because some of your uh, images look like they are uh, converted from uh, infrared. There are a couple from the Smoky Mountains on my website that I used that infrared camera for as I was playing around with it. But that's about it. I've really not done much with it and I'd like to get back into it. I think what I would need to do is just hang around the Smoky Mountains in the spring a little bit more because that's such an amazing place. Anytime you have water and trees in spring, I think that would truly lend to the black and white experience. I'm sorry, the infrared experience. Any other questions for uh, Jennifer? Jennifer Duckmassner here again. Uh, I had the pleasure of listening to you when you gave a presentation for the Maron Photography Club a couple months oh. ago. Uh -huh. And I believe you made a statement, something to the effect that fine art is not reality. Would you expand on that a little bit and say what you really have on your mind there? Sure. So I landscape photography to me is not based in reality, but fine art is. Um, let me make sure I'm saying this the correct way. I don't see landscape photography as anything other than based in realism, although we can alter the perception. But black and white photography, I don't see that it is based in realism because at least for me and a large population, I see in color. So for me to view everything around me by tonality instead of by the realism that it is, to me, it becomes a little bit of an illusion that we get to play with and try and create something with. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Jennifer? I think that is it. Jennifer, thank you so okay. much for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. much. Thanks. Let's, let's hear a round of applause if you'd unmute yourself for Jennifer. Oh. Thank you. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Very good, Fantastic. Jennifer. Thank you. It's great. Your your, uh, processing, your processing demonstration was really uh, interesting too. In addition to the your your thought process, so well, thank, thank you. you. I've always think it's important to see the method behind the you know the image, right? Got to be able to see mm -hmm. that. So yeah. and and anyway. I appreciated that your that the beginning part about having the right mindset and going into this, clearing your mind and being mm -hmm. open to the possibilities. I think that's right. so important to be creative. It is important. And it's hard to remind ourselves to do that sometimes because we do get busy. But if you can try and remind yourself to clear your mind, to take a deep breath, it's not a race. I believe, I know you'll find results continue to improve over time and you become a stronger artist. Yeah. Now, I know it's been a few years, but uh, do you remember the uh, time you visited with us out at the Mechanics of Art Center? Absolutely, yeah, I do. Got to actually see you in person. Yeah, that was yeah. what, 2019, I think. No, was that 2019? Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure of the year. No, it was pre pandemic. <laughs> it was. <laughs> you know, I remember driving over, I think, from my dad's over in Pittsburgh, and I yes. drove over and saw you guys, and no, always Very will good. remember that. Well, this is the next best <laughs> thing, and it was uh, your, your presentation was outstanding. Really, really enjoyed it. Anybody well, else have any you. questions or comments? Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Merle, anything you want to say to, to wrap things up? No, thank you very much, Jennifer. We appreciate it. And uh, uh, thanks. Thank yep. you, Merle. I guess I'll see you. Well, I'll at least see you um, soon for in Lamar Valley for a night. I'll see you Wednesday night, I think, right? Oh, that's right. Yeah, we have a class Wednesday night. I'll see you then. <laughs> <laughs>
Who Thank knows? As, as, a result of your, as a result of your presentation, you might see a few of these other people on your uh, workshops too. That'd be wonderful. Uh, Always very, welcome people. Very <laughs> good. Okay. Happy holidays, right. everyone. Thanks, Jennifer. Happy holidays. Good night, guys. Happy holidays. Enjoy, enjoy your trip. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Yay. Well, my well, gosh, we had 50, what, 52? Yeah, something like that. That was great. Yeah, good yeah, turnout. Good. I saw a lot of names on the list there that I didn't, uh, or a, a bunch that I didn't recognize. So they must have been from the other clubs. Yeah, maybe they'll join. Yep. Could be, could be. And 807, yeah, that went pretty quickly. She was pretty succinct. Right. Yeah, her images are beautiful. You know, yeah, I thought the interesting thing I thought about her presentation is she showed so many pictures, but she never talked about any particular one except the ones at the end that she developed. Mm -hmm. It was all a matter of, you know, talking about the process and, you know, seeing in black and white and, you know, mm -hmm. being yeah. deceptive. Well, I'm just kind of wondering if you can use those processes for things other than landscapes. I imagine you can. Yes, absolutely. Uh, just maybe not to the extent, you know, uh, when she goes for high contrast, she's pushing the texture slider and the clarity slider and really going for a, a dramatic look through the increased contrast. And you just wouldn't do that as much. Uh, with a regular uh, color image, but absolutely the techniques for using the radial filter, the all that digital dodging and burning, you know that that is yeah. I can see the architectural uh, uh, t uh, subjects. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then Joe it's and I were just working on doing this a couple of days ago together, and uh, we talked about Serge Ramelli and the the uh, uh, videos tutorials that he has about his process. And he uses the same process of all of his pictures. Mm -hmm. And it's all a matter of, of increasing the contrast, but subtly making some things brighter, some things darker. And it adds such a, a, a sense of depth and richness to the image. Yeah. Just very nice. It's interesting that he's her um, use of dodging and burning is not with the brush, but rather with the radio filter. And I know in my particular case, I, I've migrated to that, but sometimes I go back to the brush again and bring out the highlights and rocks and stuff. She, yeah, she, she did a great job on that. She really she did, did. Yeah. And, and I too have gone away from the brush a bit and tend to use the radio filter more. Mm -hmm. Although I still use the select sky. I, I haven't seen as you and I discussed, if you take it too far, you can get the fringing you know, showing up. But I've thought that the, the masking tools in Lightroom Classic now do a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. So I would I would think I would I'm going to continue you know to use those like select sky, select subject. I use those a lot. Yeah. In preference to a, a radial filter. Dennis, if I may ask another question of you. Uh, sure. On your four-month tour, are you going to do photo processing? Are you taking a laptop with you capable of doing Lightroom, uh, Photoshop? I am. And uh, I, I, do, I, almost, I hardly ever process on a laptop. I prefer my desktop. Of but course. Since, because of the length of the trip, yes, I'll be, I'll be processing on the laptop. We'll be anxious to see what you do. No, oh, appreciate it. Yeah, it be, be, should be fun. I'll, I'll post regularly planning to great linda how are you doing <laughs> hanging on till the end there okay dennis we will see you and i'll be talking to you in the next couple of days i am sure very good very good okay thanks yeah okay. excellent presentation that was really nice yeah, that was okay. good okay good night okay see take you, care right now good night see you lucinda and thanks again and linda <laughs> Here we go.